Companion animals today include traditional species such as dogs, cats, rabbits, horses, guinea pigs, but more frequently today also include so-called exotic animals such as reptiles, amphibians and birds. Veterinarians are more frequently being called upon to conduct clinical examinations of animals such as imperial scorpions and African tarantulas and being provided with guidance uh, with respect to the safe and humane handling and clinical examination of these species. As well as providing us with their companionship, animals such as dogs serve many other roles in society today. They can be used in police and security work, as rescue dogs, uh, as assistance animals, uh, assisting deaf people, blind people, uh, people with various medical conditions, and those who are socially deprived and lacking in um, other social opportunities. Companion animals are now found across all sectors of society, and some of them have risen to the highest offices, making public appearances, issuing statements, having fan clubs, and entire literary careers. Socks, the Clinton's cat, at the height of his career received more than 200 letters a day, requiring a dedicated fan club, director and a staff to handle uh, his enormous level of correspondence. Within the United Kingdom, there has been a resident Treasury and Downing Street cat employed as an official mouser since the reign of King Henry VIII. The chief mouser to the Cabinet Office is the official title of the cat of the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, resident at number 10 Downing Street. Animals even have their own political parties. Uh, the Animal Welfare Party exists in the United Kingdom. Similar parties exist in a host of other European countries, as well as the US, Canada, Australia and others. However, despite the substantial social success of many of these companion animals, many of their counterparts are unfortunately sadly neglected. They're very often taken from their biological families at a young age, placed within human families where we control what they do, uh, what they eat, where they go. We even control activities such as their reproductive behaviours. We subject them to a variety of medical procedures, vaccinations, dewormers and surgical sterilisations. Philosophers such as Gary Francioni assert that our use of animals as companions in this way is morally wrong because we've made them entirely dependent on us. He says that these animals remain in a netherworld of vulnerability, dependent on us for everything that matters to them, and he says that they are truly animal slaves. In their book Zoopolis, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka take issue with the views of philosophers such as Francioni, noting that such hardline animal rights positions have failed to resonate with mainstream social opinion and have uh, failed to stem the rising tide of animal exploitation within farming systems, laboratories, homes and many other settings around the world over the last several hundred years. However, they note that mainstream developed societies are increasingly open to conceptualisations of good animal welfare, having reported a range of uh, legislative and public policy reforms affecting animals in a wide variety of settings. Donaldson and Kimlicker also criticised traditional animal rights philosophy as being deficient because it focuses on quite a narrow range of negative rights, the rights of sentient animals not to be owned, killed, taken from one's family or exploited in various ways. Donaldson and Kimlicker note that Traditional animal rights theory says very little about the positive obligations that we ought to have to animals. When we consider our relations with other people, it's true that uh, we should avoid harming them in all sorts of ways, but we also have positive obligations toward them that depend on our relationships to them. We have greater obligations to those in our immediate families, our close friends, even the citizens of the countries uh, in which we reside, than we do to random human beings. Donaldson and Kimlicker speak of animals as being wild or free-living animals parallel to humans of foreign sovereign nations. They speak of so-called liminal animals which live on the boundaries of human society amongst us but not fully domesticated as being animal denizens. And then they speak of animals that are fully domesticated and very much dependent on us as potentially being co-citizens of our societies. They assert that these different relationships justify different levels of cooperative relationships with these different types of animals, and they impose upon us different levels of 
obligation with respect to the duties and responsibilities that we should exercise towards these different groups of animals. They conceptualise a future society in which the interests of animals would be more fully considered uh, using models such as guardianship, which we already use uh, to advocate for the interests of people who are not uh, mentally competent human adults because they're very young, they're very old, uh, they're ill or they're injured in various ways. If we reconsidered domesticated animals as co-citizens of our societies with appropriate guardianship and representation, perhaps we might finally have a more cooperative, collaborative and less exploitative relationship with the other animals with whom we share our societies.